uh, hi, uh, so um, Alex Robertson. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of my uh, recent research uh, looking at um, a new calcium electrolyte or relatively new calcium electrolyte uh, by in situ 10. So a very brief overview. So before going on to the science, I'm actually going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the electro, well, the, uh, the background to how we want to look at this electrochemical reaction. So we've got, we're wanting to understand how it behaves at the nanoscale and at high temporal resolutions. So how we want to use 10, uh, but some of the experimental considerations we need to take into account to allow that to happen. And then I'll go on to talk a little bit about the actual electrochemistry and the science. So uh, yeah, so as I kind of alluded to there, if we're wanting to uh, kind of track an electrochemical reaction in at the nanoscale and at kind of uh, real time temporal resolutions, we you know the TEM is a real uh, is kind of an ideal approach in terms of the spatial resolution to temporal resolution aspects. But in terms of actually um, being able to image liquids which you need to be able to do in an electrochemical reaction, that's that far of a difficult because it's not really compatible with the vacuum requirements of a TEM. And so there's various approaches to this, to, to how we can actually uh, get around the problem of looking at a fluid inside a high vacuum environment. Um, there's no silver bullet method. They all have their trade-offs, they all have their ups and downs. Uh, so we actually need to come at it from the point of view of what's the scientific question we want to look at, what are, what's the science we're interested in. And so for me, for our research, we, we, we want to look at how electrolytes for the batteries mainly uh, behave and how they under, you know, particularly when they undergo electrical cycling. So that electrical cycling, the need for electrical cycling uh, kind of eliminates for us just encapsulating liquid between graphene membranes, uh, as have been, there's been some very nice papers on this, but unfortunately you can't pattern metal electrodes on these graphene membranes, which kind of precludes you from being able to uh, apply some form of bias to instigate the electrochemical reaction. So we can't do that approach. The other main approach is the two methods on the left here, what I would call an open cell approach. So this is where essentially these rely so on using a liquid that has a very low vapor pressure, so mainly ionic liquids. So these just do not vaporize uh, under the high vacuum conditions for 10. But unfortunately, if we're wanting to look at an electrolyte, uh, electrolyte chemistry, one of the main parameters you have uh, that you're wanting to explore, if you like, is actually changing the solvent. Uh, and so you want to have the flexibility to use arbitrary solvents. And so this kind of eliminates this. So kind of right, um, so the, the, the kind of one remaining method that's compatible with liquid imaging uh, that actually allows us to be agnostic towards what liquid we look at and also apply that supply and bias is to encapsulate uh, the liquid using uh, silicon MEMS chips, where we use a essentially a specially designed holder in order to encapsulate the silicon sandwich. Um, as I show here, so this is a, a holder from Protochips, which is, is a holder that I use here at Oxford. Um, so essentially your customized holder is uh, sandwiching these silicon chips together uh, to enclose liquid. Inside each silicon chip, we have got a, a silicon nitride membrane. So very, very thin, 30 nanometer thin membrane, which when aligned gives us a window through which the electron beam is able to transmit and give us a view of the uh, reaction. Um, as I kind of show a little bit on the cross section on the right there. So that's a very brief overview of uh, how we can do Alperando electrochemical TEM uh, of these kind of electrochemical reactions. Uh, so just a little bit of a uh, specifics on the, the MEMS chips. So there's actually a variety of chips you can employ because depending on the science you want to do, you, you may have uh, different requirements. So for us, we're wanting to do electrochemical studies. So we do we need some form of electrogeometry to supply a bias. And in particular, we're wanting to understand the electrolytes chemistry uh, and how it behaves just on a metal electrode. So we're not we're not interested in um, say its interaction with say graphite or some cathode metal oxide material, because what we just wanted to see is how it would interact with a current collector, as I'll come on to on the next slide. Um, and so we just wanted platinum electrodes, so platinum working, and also counter and reference electrodes, um, which are platinum's good because it shouldn't have any parasitic or confounding side reactions or alloying reactions. Uh, and we can just look at how the calcium plates and strips off of this platinum electrode. And then we kind of seal that sandwich up together uh, with a sealing MEMS chip with some flow spaces configured, allowing us to flow liquid across or to replenish the electrolytes across the active area. Kind of, that's a very brief overview of some of the, the kind of technical background. Uh, so the size itself. So calcium as a kind of electrolyte for rechargeable batteries has been of interest for since well, maybe since the 90s was when some of the first main papers came out, but actually it was long for a lot for most of the past you know couple of decades, few decades now. It's been the research since this has been largely stymied by the fact that 
in a rechargeable battery, an important consideration is the electrolyte, the electrochemistry needs to be fully reversible. That's, it needs to be rechargeable. Now, unfortunately, what happened was when you deposited calcium, uh, a inhibiting kind of passivating layer would form, which meant you just couldn't dissolve it. Uh, and this is a shame. It's ultimately we'd actually be able to calcium uh, calcium electrochemistry would be quite payable over say you know, lithium ion that we use at the moment because calcium typically isn't quite so reactive, it isn't quite so volatile. So in a current lithium ion battery, we have a graphite electrode on the anode side, and we use this instead of just saying lithium metal, uh, which would be better in terms of the weight efficiency because lithium metal just degrades. There's all sorts of problems with the deficient with the degradation of the lithium metal just because lithium is so reactive. So we need the graphite there as a kind of bookshelf to kind of store our lithium ions in in a safe manner. Uh, calcium, ideally, at least theoretically, is sufficiently unreactive. You could just use a calcium metal anode so you ditch the weight and volume overhead of having to use something like graphite, an integration host, uh, for stability's sake. Um, but this passivation layer that formed on calcium after it was deposited was a real problem. It stopped this from being reversible. But over the past few years, a few groups, including a collaborative group led by Peter Bruce here in Oxford, uh, have developed electrolyte chemistries which are very efficient even at room temperatures and so that I've highlighted their work up here so they can see there's roughly 95 percent efficiency which actually is terrible for rechargeable batteries but is historically very good for calcium electrochemistries at room temperature and so this is a kind of starting point and it's kind of rekindled a lot of interest in this electrochemistry so from my point of view I wanted to see if we could use uh, the operando TEM to understand some of the uh, morphologies that we saw during electroplating and stripping or de deposition, if you like, of this calcium metal, and see, see if this gave us any insights into the nature of the passivation layer, the dynamics, and the trade offs, if you like, between that and the rate of deposition and stripping. And so, just uh, to show you, so there's a brief video here, so hopefully it plays. So, what you'll see is on the right, you've got the platinum working electrode there. We just immediately see, as soon as we start plating, this dendritic growth of calcium comes shooting out. Uh, so we'll look at that in a little bit more detail on this next slide. So yeah, just to emphasize, this was a very high current density. So I'm going to talk about images. I'm not going to show you more videos because it's a bit easier to explain what's going on with uh, still frames. So we can see that the current density is 100 milliamps per centimeter squared. This is a very high current density, but we just wanted to, it's useful to explore the kind of the, the, the high, the kind of end, the, the kind of extreme conditions, if you like, first. So. As at the beginning, we can see during the plating stage, so galvanostatic plating, we're asking it to supply a current density by changing the voltage. Um, we can see a dendrite formed very quickly. And what we are expecting to see is when we reverse the polarity, so reversing the voltage, we expect to see the calcium methyl dendrite just redissolve because it, it should be fully really reversible. But actually what we see, and this is why dendrite formation is so bad in rechargeable batteries, is the dendrite, instead of just dissolving, uh, as I kind of indicate there with a white arrow, it just seems to move away from the electrode. And that's because the calcium at the base of the dendrite is dissolved first. And that means it's become electrically isolated from our working electrode. The rest of the calcium is therefore unable to dissolve. And this means that all that calcium metal in the dendrite is now locked away. It's no longer involved in any further reactions. And so that represents a big efficiency loss if we're talking about a rechargeable battery system. So that's why dendrites are bad. Uh, there's other reasons as well. And you know, uh, uh, I'll just briefly show in a subsequent cycle, we can see further dendrites growing. And what's quite interesting is we kind of see the tip of this one, as I show in the yellow box there. It kind of, instead of staying as this rarefied needle shape, it kind of turns into this chubby blunt geometry. Uh, we, we talk a little bit about why that is in, in, in the paper. Looking at more realistic current densities, uh, so one and 10 milliamp per centimeter squared, we also see, we see most importantly, there's, there's no dendrite formation, which is a relief. Uh, but we also see the very low current density, we instead see this kind of very uh, strong bias towards wanting to preferentially nucleate. Uh, and instead of these nucleated calcium sites growing, we instead get lots of small nucleation sites. There's a strong preference towards nucleation. Uh, and then as we increase the current density further, so the rate of calcium plating further, instead of nucleation, we seem to see like uniform growth of a few globules. So we just see like one large deposit, if you like, continually grow rather than lots of nucleation events. And so this helps us understand some of the uh, trade-offs, if you like, between deposition rate and the rate of formation of a passivation layer. Uh, yeah, it's just some images showing this more clearly. So we were able just to rinse the silicon chips afterwards uh, with a solvent and have a look in the SEM to get slightly better resolution without the liquid in the way, uh, which kind of confirms what we're seeing in the tent. So there, as I say, there's a lot more Science, if you like, uh, explanation. This is that can, you can use this to interpret the, the dynamics of the passivation layer formation, which we will go into in detail in the paper. I've not really got time in this brief summary uh, talk to go through now. So, uh, yeah, I hope that was interesting. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for listening.